Dr. Matos, this week's reading. <coughs> you should avenge the vengeance of the Bnei Yisro from the Midianites. And then you will be gathered up to your people. Meaning that you will pass on. Meaning the destruction of the Midianite people was going to be the condition or the setting for Moshe to pass on. Once that's accomplished, Moshe will pass on. So here the Orchaim HaKadosh points out, I mean, why should his death be contingent about on the destruction of the Midianite people? He says, until that moment, the setting is not perfect enough for Moshe to pass on. Why? Every Jew has a potential in terms of his spirituality. When we speak about Olam Abba, the world to come, what is the world to come? What exactly is that location? What is its context? As the Ramchal explains, Olam Abo is based on your relationship with God. The Rambam writes then in Hilchus Tshuva, the laws of Tshuva, that every Jew could be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. The obvious question is, could any Jew be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu? Do you think God is going to communicate with us face to face? Factually, Moshe was the only Jew who was qualified to be the conduit between God and the Jewish people to receive the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu. So how is it possible every Jew could be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu? What is the claim against the person? The person has limitation. And the claim cannot be more than his capacity. It cannot be beyond his capacity. A person is born with handicaps, mentally handicapped. Although he's limited, there's no claim against him. Not only is no claim against him, he's not considered competent, and he has no, no obligation or responsibility. What's his purpose? That's another discussion. What exactly is the value of that person's life? Because if man was only created to make choices, to choose between good and evil, this person is not in a position to make choices, but there's no claim against him. So the claim against the person is you're given a potential, you're endowed with certain abilities, they were given for a specific reason, you must act and draw on them, and actualize them and apply them in the context that they're meant to be applied. And if you don't, that's considered a failing. Moshe Rabbeinu's potential was one of a kind. Relatively speak to anyone else, it was unlimited. Moshe Shoko Kenegi Yisrael. Moshe was the equivalent of the whole Jewish people combined. That's who Moshe was. Which Jew has that dimension of, of soul, of neshama? No Jew. Therefore, what's demanded of Moshe, Moshe has to meet his potential. He has to actualize and apply himself and develop and advance himself based on what he was endowed with. Any other Jew, based on his spiritual endowment, which is based on his, the makeup of his neshama, he has to address that. So if any Jew meets his potential, regardless of how minuscule it may be, or how limited it may be, you know less than Moshe Rabbeinu in terms of you've addressed what you were supposed to address in your lifetime. Therefore, Ramam says in Hilchus Tshuva that every Jew could be as great as Moshe because in terms of application, investment of ability, you're fully invest invested as Hashem wanted you to be invested. Moshe Rabbeinu, a number of times we feel, we find, because of the incident what took place at the burning bush at the Sneh, where actually... He was, he was 
overly obstinate. Although Moshe's intent was humility, what he didn't want to accept the position as the Goel, the Redeemer of Israel, so he lost, he forfeited the Kuna. He forfeited the priesthood. It was passed on to Aaron. Aaron and his children. Nevertheless, the Rechaim of Kodesh points out, as you see, that would atone for his failing. Now, what happens when a person sins? When a person sins, it creates a distance between himself and God. That distance, what, what does that mean? That means when a person, after a person passes on, he cannot cleave and be attach himself to God to the degree he could have if that distance wouldn't exist. So if a person does tshuva before he dies, he repents, which is a rehabilitation of that, that, that gap is closed when a person doesn't do tshuva. And it's interesting, I mean, the, the many works that point this out, tshuva only rehabilitates the negative. It does not reinstate the positive. The person was meant to wear tefillin. He didn't wear tefillin. He's not accredited for wearing tefillin, even if one does tshuva. If a person was meant to eat matzah and didn't eat matzah, or say the Shema and did not say the Shema, as much as that's tshuva, there's no claim against him that he didn't say it. But in terms of the degree that he would have adva advanced himself or spiritualized himself, that he's lacking. That he's not going to have. And the Chavot Chaim points out, even a person has to be atoned after he dies and purged by going to Gehenim. But factually, Gehenim will allow him to be admitted to the world to come. But factually, he's going to be deficient. And the areas which were meant to, ben, meant to be developed and fully fleshed out in the spiritual sense, it's not going to be. And that's for all eternity. All eternity. Unless God gives you a chance to come back and do those mitzvahs, what we speak about Gilgal, reincarnation, only then could you correct what you missed in terms of the positive. The negative, you could be purged. But for the positive, it's fixed in stone forever. That's what it is. Moshe Rabbeinu had to install Aaron and to be the Kohanim. You could say, if I put salt on the wounds, it's enough that I forfeited the priesthood for myself and my children. I have to be the one to install them, to dress them, to immerse them. Moshe, you have to be the one. Because only when you do that selflessly and you do it with joy, with simcha, that will be a full reinstatement. And that gap, what we call that pirut, that separation is going to be closed. And you'll fully be able to cleave to Hashem. Over here, the Orchim HaKadosh cites the Midrash, which is Midrash by Pinchos, that when he avenged the vengeance of God, Pinchos, he originally went to consult with Moshe and Aaron. They were, they were beside themselves. They didn't know exactly what to do. Over there, it attributes Moshe's not doing, although he forgot, says that somehow... He forgot the law. It was due to somehow Rafa Yodov. Some reason, and there's a claim against Moshe Rabbeinu. He should have been the one to act. Should have been the one to act, because I point out something which he doesn't say. So, Pira Shoyodov Monea Bidin, there was something which would have interfered uh, justice wise. Moshe Rabbeinu wouldn't have been able to achieve what he was meant to achieve. Shiyikro Amov Viodua. It says, Acha Teosef Al Amov. Now you return to your lo Amov, to your people, to your location. He cannot return. Unless this is corrected, he cannot return. Achibinel be Mishpot, ki al kol yove Hashem be Mishpot, usviva of Nisharim od. It's very interesting here. Now the Gemara tells us in a number of locations, specifically at Akurish Bokhme, Dakti Kim Hasid of Kuvata Sara. God is exacting with his chassidim, with those who are devoutly pious, scrupulously pious, as much as a hairbreadth. If they deviate as much as a hairbreadth, the broad justice is delivered. Another question is why? So the way you understand it, first of really that devout and that scrupulous in his observance and the service of Hashem, the whole concept of inadvertency is almost not possible. If God is always before your eyes, and you're always cogniz cognizant of your responsibility, how do you ever fail? 
I mean, the average person, when he fails, he actually, he just glosses over everything. He doesn't have the sensitivity to serve God as he should. So he continuously fails. It's like a person's groping in the dark. Is there a question why he stumbles? But a person who sees and everything's illuminated, why do you stumble? That's called negligence. You weren't careful. You should have been more careful. You wouldn't have stumbled. The tzaddik who was illuminated, where all his spiritual senses are fully in operation, even on something which is much as a hairbreadth, how do you not see it? It should be blatantly clear. Therefore, failing even at something which is infinitesimal, spiritually speaking, is a claim. That's what it is. That's the way it's understood. But according to what he's saying here, that Hashem is now, a person is at an unlimited distance from where it should be. A little more, a little less doesn't make a difference. But a tzaddik, because the person is so distant from Hashem, but a tzaddik, what does Hashem want for the tzaddik? If you, you're almost there, could you imagine making the finish line and missing it by a thousandth of a second? You'd say, you know something, if you would have taken the initiative to a slightly greater degree, you would have finished. You would have been there in time. A thousandth of a second. How is it possible? So the person would want that person to be a winner. He would do whatever he can to make sure, but a person who misses it by three hours doesn't really make a difference. Of course, it's a failing. It's a failing. That person, it's a failing for that person. But for the tzaddik, that there's a special relationship between HaKadosh Baruch and the tzaddik, he wants the tzaddik to be fully attached the way he should be. To miss it by an iota, by a hairbreadth, it's unfortunate. It's a tragedy. You could have been all the way there and you weren't there. Therefore, even if they deviate as much as a hairbreadth, he's going to do whatever he can to punish them in this world. Why? Because it really makes that difference. And, but he wants it because that's Sadiqim. Because they're devout. Because he has that special relationship. Because he has that special love for them. Therefore, he wants them to succeed to that degree. A greater love for them. So because Moshe Rabbeinu, as he cites the Medjish, it says, Rafa Yodov, he was slightly laid back. If he would have applied himself to a greater degree, he would have. He would have succeeded. He would have done the act of, of zealotry himself. This perfect person, Moshe Rabbeinu, this Rabbi Maishas Imri, is quoting the Midrash. He should be the one to take the vengeance, to be the zealot, and not Pinchas. Therefore, when the time came for his passing, What's the correction? What's the, what, what's the, the failing? You should have taken the vengeance. Now, who are the ones who were really culpable? The Midianites. Now you have to take. Now you have to take the vengeance. And now, when he completes this correction, Yosef Elov El Amov Ben Sotan. Now there's no prosecution any longer. This is the kindness of God. And a special love to those who are beloved to Him. And he will console them with the scales of justice. That's because of that special relationship. That's what Hashem wants from Moshe Rabbeinu. But I was thinking maybe to add to this. The Gemara tells us that Hillel had 80 students. Hillel, Hillel Azoki. Who was the greatest of the 80? Rabbi Yonah Sabin Uziel. He was the greatest of them. Who was the smallest of the smallest of them? Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka, who was the Torah sage, the leader of the Jewish people after the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka. Now, what determined whether who was the greatest, who was the smallest? So the Gemara says, "What did Rabbi Yonah ben Uziel know? He knew everything. 
everything in Torah, everything about anything. He understood the language of the birds, the language of the trees, everything. The language of angels, the angels spoke. And what does Rabbi Yochan and Zake know? And those enumerates what he knew. His breadth of knowledge, identical to Rabbi Yonah and Zion. Identical. So it asks, if that's the case, why is he the greatest and why is Rabbi Yochan and Zake considered among the, the smallest? So the Gemara says, in two locations, because from Yonas and Uziel would study Torah, the birds that would fly over would be within four cubits, over, would fly over his head, which were within four, four cubits of himself, would actually would be burnt by fire. Rav Yochan and Zakai, the birds, when they would fly over his head, when he studied that same Torah, they would not be consumed by fire. So that is an indication of the innate holiness of the people, of each of them, that Rabbi Yonas and Uziel's holiness was so intense that the birds would be consumed when they'd fly over his head. That's Rabbi Yonah, that's Rabbi Yonah, that's Rabbi Yonah, that's Rabbi wasn't that. Now, so the Ramchal goes to explain in one location, what does that mean? So he explains, you have a person. He says, he said, you have a watch movement. And in, the, in a watch, you have many movements. And what do you have? You have wheels in the watch. And each wheel is notched. And each wheel is attached, locks it with another wheel. So as one wheel turns, many wheels turn. That's it. But the question is, how many wheels is, it depends how many wheels is it going to turn. It depends how many wheels it's connected to. Now, when a Jew does a mitzvah, there is a consequence. It affects, it has an endless, infinite effect in the spiritual realm. It activates forces. It creates spiritual worlds. And the endless things happen. These are ramifications of doing the mitzvah. What determines the degree to the effect? It depends on the dimension of the person's spirituality. Rabbi Yonas and Ben Uziel, his spirituality was so overwhelming when he would study, the intensity of his, of his studying doesn't mean the mental intensity. His, the innateness of his neshama, of his soul, would generate a power which Rabbi Yochanan and Zakeh's neshama didn't generate that kind of power. So the ramifications and the result of what he would do when he would study was a different, ramif different degree. The birds being burnt and being consumed over said that was only an indication of the intensity and the dimension of the Kedusha. Rabbi Yochanan and Zakeh did not have that. Did not have that. Therefore, based on that, it's not just it's not knowledge. It's based on just the essence of the person. Once mentioned, not long ago, when the Briskarov passed away, so the Chaim Shmulev at Zechat Tzadik Lebrach, who was a near Rashiva, was going to say a, a eulogy for the Briskarov and Zechat Tzadik Lebrach. And he says, what could I speak about the Briskarov? Briskarov was the son of Reb Chaim Briskar. He said he was one of he was the leading Torah sage. How would I depict him that people should have an appreciation for what he was? He says, maybe we'll tell stories about him. He says, could you really grasp a person by telling a story? He says, I'll give you an example why you can't. You cannot appreciate a person by hearing a story about him. For instance, the Torah tells us a story and describes in detail of Roma Venus hospitality. Three wayfarers come. He runs towards them. He prostrates himself. He asks them to accept his hospitality to the point he pleads with them they should accept it. And he says, lie under the shade of my tree. Take some water to wash your feet. He brings him, he slaughters three calves, this and that. Whatever he does, offers his bread. He does many things. There seems to be doesn't seem to be such a great act of hospitality. Hospitable. Even he'd say, as the Mara tells us, that the hospitality of Abraham Avinu, the Suda Shlomo B'Shaito, King Solomon, the height of his power, the, ba the, the table that he would offer food was not the equivalent of what Abraham offered the angels. Even say that. But what should be the ramifications? If we would host a, a, a guest as Abraham hosted the guest, what do you think the consequence 
the positive result of that would be? Do you think God would provide spiritual food that would be absorbed in their inner organs for 40 years for billions of people? Do you think God would, 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 would provide that? Do you think God would have a rock split and endless water would be provided for millions of people for 40 years and for all their livestock? Do you think God would do that? And do you think God would provide clouds of glory which will protect you from the elements and from everything else and heal you and protect you and cause your clothing to grow on your bodies and to cleanse them, to launder them? Do you think that's what's going to be? If we would do that, do you think that's going to be? But if you look at just the mundane act, so he slaughtered three calves. He needed so much bread. He gave them so much of this. Whatever he gave them, do we understand so factually? Why was Avram's hospitality, why did it generate that level of result? The Ani Yaakovot. The clouds of glory were in the matter of Yishonu Tachaseitz. Lie under the shade of my tree. Echo pas lechem. Take a morsel of bread. This is the man. The water is, is the what? Is the rock. That's Be'erushel Miriam. Why? If we would do it, it wouldn't generate that. We're talking about it's a different dimension of person. Because Avram Avinu, his dimension of his soul, he introduced God to existence. He's the only human being who came upon God through his own quest of truth. His action is a different dimension. Although, in the physical sense, it's identical. But in terms of the innateness of that, we're talking about worlds apart is not enough to differentiate between Avram and anything anybody else does. The difference, as we said, between Rabbi Yonasim Zeal and Rabbi Yonasim Zakai is a semblance of Avram versus the world. That's all it is, nothing more than that. If Moshe, who is Moshe? Moshe Shoko connected to Israel. If he would have avenged the Midianites, if he initially would have killed Zimri, what would have happened? Pithos was a zealot, as it says. He merited the covenant of peace. He and his children, for all eternity, are going to be Kohanim, although he was not anointed. It's all true. He eradicated the Chil Hashem, Zimri's desecration of God's name, public desecration. He did it all. He did it in the Shem Shemayim. But Moshe doing the exact same action, it would have had a different result. Different result. We find, because the Midrash, the Midrash tells us that Zimri was the prince of the tribe of Shimon. Because uh, the 24,000 people who died in the plague were from the tribe of Shimon. Because they were the ones who kept cohabited with the Moabite women. So the plague struck them down. Because of what they did, Zimri and his tribe, there was never Shoftim appointed to the tribe of Shimon. Like before we had the king, who actually were the leaders of the generation, we read, they were judges. They were never judges from the, the tribe of Shimon. Why? Because of the incident of Zimri and his tribe. Because Moshe Rabbeinu really had a claim against them. He had a gripe against them. What do you have a gripe? Zimri was killed. The 24,000 casualties. Pinchas avenged Hashem's honor. Why did he have such, how do we use the word, animosity that he had a claim against them? Why? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu struck a rock. He was told to speak to the rock. He struck the rock. God said, because you had the ability and an opportunity, Lagdisheni, to consecrate my name in public, before, and you did not, therefore you will not enter into the land. You and your brother will not enter into the land. Aaron passed away first, but ultimately at, before the 40 years, at the end of the 40 years, Moshe Rabbeinu passes away. Of course, of course, the main believer, the water which came about as a result of the quarrel with the Jews, they came with a claim. Now, why did Moshe Rabbeinu make a mistake? Why did he make such a mistake? He shouldn't have made it. If God wanted him to go in, do you think he would have made the mistake? The answer is God didn't want him to go in. In life, you have to have siyate dishmayo, you have to have the, be divine, divine assistance to see things clearly. Of course, when you see things 
which is slightly blurred, very often you make mistakes. But if Hashem is watching over you, you don't make the mistakes. For instance, we find Nodav and Aviu, the sons of Aaron, were the future leaders of Klal Yisrael, the equivalent of Moshe and Aaron. They would have been the successors. It wouldn't have been Yoshua necessarily. But what happened? The day that the Mishkan was inaugurated and established on a personal, permanent level, they brought a strange fire. They brought an Ezzorah into the sanctuary and they were struck down by God. Now, why, so there's a discussion, why, what exactly was the sin? Is it because they didn't consult the Moshe Rabbeinu, which was a disrespect? They were more halochah with Rabon. Is it because they drank wine? There's a question based on how to interpret the psukim, the verses. What exactly was the failing? But, but simultaneously it says, why did they die? Because since our own participated in the Chet Egel, not in the worship of Chas Vishol, but only even as a delay tactic to gather the gold, there was liability, there was culpability to Aaron, and therefore, two of his sons had to die. Moshe, originally, all four sons were going to die, but Moshe's Tfilah annulled 50% of the decree. So two survived, the most, most special of the two passed away, were struck down by God. So this obvious question, they were adults. The Torah tells us, Ish yumos, that a person dies only on his own account. One doesn't die because of his parents' sins. Aaron deserves to be punished. So good, let Aaron be punished. His children dying definitely are a punishment for him. Yes, he's paying. But how do you take his sons for his failing? They failed. So what they They did fail. So they failed. The reason why they're dying is because they're being punished. It's not because of the sin of, of the eagle, the chet eagle. So how do we somehow reconcile the two things? How do we do it? So the Orachim HaKadosh explains, we have a principle, chas, ragle chasid of Yishmor, the Pasuk says, God watches the feet of his devoutly pious. He watches over them. So the Rabbeinu Bachya writes in one of the introductions to the Parshish, he says, a person who's a runner, professional runner. As careful as you be, it's impossible to avoid a sports injury. Because a human being is, well, humanly, there's always a degree of error and not being cognizant every moment. It's inevitable. You're going to be hurt. You're going to sustain an injury. So that's what the post says. But chaste ragle chasid of Yishmar. The feet of the Hasidim Hashem watches over. So that even though naturally they should be harmed, because God watches over them and they're not harmed, He allows them always to have that level of clarity that they should never fail. But you have to merit that. Ragli Hasid of Yishmar. Aaron, because he failed with the Egel, therefore his children did not merit the clarity in his merit. Why did they deserve to die? Because they, they chose to do the wrong thing. So therefore, they're dying on their own account. They failed. But, in the, but their dying is going to cause pain to their father. And if Aaron is so special, God should provide clarity to the children that they should not fail. The answer is, but since Aaron deserved that degree of pain, therefore, they did not have the clarity. And they, and they made the mistake. But why did they die? Because they made the wrong choice. This is understanding. That's, so now, Moshe struck the rock. Why did he strike the rock? It says because he became angry. And when a person is in a state of anger, a person is not fully, con in, he loses clarity when a person becomes, he became angry because they spoke disrespectfully. They said, he said, Shimon no Hamorim, listen you rebellious people. Because they act, they didn't ask respectfully for the water. So he reacted. Being in a state of anger, he made a mistake, struck. But God could have caused him to be calm. If he would have become calm, he wouldn't have. He would have spoken to Rock and wouldn't have struck the rock. Why did God cause, allow him to make the mistake? Of course, he made the mistake. Why did God provide that clarity and that tranquility and that control that he should not make the mistake? You know what the answer is? It's evident. God didn't want him to go into Israel. He didn't want so because God didn't want to go into Israel, 
Therefore, he did not provide the clarity. Therefore, he made the mistake, and he struck the rock. But why didn't he want him to go into Eretz Israel? Why? So there's a Rashi in the portion of Joseph Rocho. Now, the Torah tells us that the burial location of Moshe, no one knows. Only God knows the burial location of Moshe. God buried Moshe, told him to ascend the mountain, and it says, Vayik bor osa bagai beretz Moab. He was buried in the Gai, the valley, in the land of Moab, and the Torah identifies the location. Mul base Paor. Opposite the location which the Jews sinned with Paor. That's the, idol, the story of Benos Moab. This is the idol that he worshipped through defecation. His burial location was Mul base Paor. So Rashi says, Kivro Hayemuchon Shem Mishashis Yimei Brashis. Mishnah tells us that the Avos, that the burial location was already created from the six days of creation, this was one of the things that was created in the twilight period, right before Shabbos began. L'chaper amasa pa'or. Because he had to be buried there to atone for the incident of pa'or. So what do you have to be buried there? That location, what does it represent? It represents an ongoing prosecution against the Jewish people. It was such a serious failing. At that moment, Therefore, as a result of that, there has to be something to counter that prosecution. Moshe's level of holiness, his dimension of being, even after he died, as it says, lo koseino, lo noslecho, he was vibrant, he was fresh, afilo bekever. His representation of his holiness was even in the grave. So even his burial location, even the location had to be created, especially for him, because Moshe is not an ordinary person. His location had to be there to count the poor. So why couldn't Moshe cross the, Jew, the Jordan to go into Eretz Israel? Because he had to be the, re, the, the counterbalance to that, to that prosecution. Otherwise, Kalei would not be able to withstand that level of prosecution. Therefore, Moshe had to be buried there. But why did he be buried there? Who instigated the Balpur? The tribe of Levi, the tribe of Shimon, Zimri ben Solu, the prince and his tribe. Therefore, Moshe had this gripe against them. In truth, why did God not allow me to have that clarity? That I struck the rock. You know why? Because you have to be buried there. You have to be buried there because you have to be in atonement. You have to be moved by base bar. That's why you can't, cross, you can't cross the Jordan. For the sake of Klal Yisrael. But why do they need that level of atonement? The answer is because you caused it. Therefore, there was never a shofate. There was never a judge from the tribe of Shimon. Okay? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu was Rafa Yodov. If Moshe would have killed Zimri and put this Chil Hashem to, to stop, are you going to say Moshe's action and, and Pinchas' action are the same? It says Moshe was Shoko Kenegusol, not Pinchas. So this is similar, as I said, just a semblance, a semblance of it. Rabbi Yonis ibn Uziel, and, and Yo, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai, breadth of knowledge identical, but the dimension of who they were, two different dimensions of people. Therefore, the birds of one's head was cons were, were consumed by fire, over Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai was not. Moshe Rabbeinu's dimension of being, there's nothing to be compared to this. If he would have killed Zimri, he would have eradicated the impurity through his act. Pintros. But there's a serious residue of that impurity because there was that residue of impurity. So now, how do you somehow eradicate that? You must destroy me, John. Now, Moshe said, So why was Moshe, why was that, did that distance? Because initially, you, you, you were the one who did not do it. If you would have done it initially, it wasn't Rafu. Because he was laid back slightly and he did not do it and Pidros did it. Because of that, but what exists? Being the impurity that exists today is why? Even after Pidros avenged God's vengeance, why does that impurity exist? Which is represented by the, by the Midianite people. 
And why is there that pirut? Because you did not, be, you were not the one who did it. But if you would have been the one to avenge it, it would have been, uh, it would have been another result. It would have been a different dimension of result. Therefore, so how do you compensate for that? You have to destroy Nijab. They have to be destroyed. By destroying, by avenging the, the Jewish people, or as Moshe Rabbeinu says, it's Nikmas Hashem b'Mijan. It's the vengeance of God in Mijan. Then you'll be reinstated, fully reinstated. Because the result of Moshe and the result of Pinchas is different. It's a different dimension of being. Just thinking. What was the greatness of Moshe when he installed Aaron and Bonov to be Kohanim? That was the last chance. Initially, he was supposed to be the Kohen. Moshe and his children. Because he failed at the burning bush, at the snare, therefore, Hashem says, Aaron and his children will be. But until they were actually installed, there was still a chance. Maybe he could somehow supplicate Hashem that maybe they could share it. Maybe not take it away from Aaron. You'll have Kohanim coming from Moshe. They're both Levim, same family. Aaron's children are Kohanim, Moshe's children. But once he installs them, it's etched in stone forever. It's lost. That's what it is. But yet, Hashem says, you must install them, you must dress them, and that's, part, that's the installation of them as Kohanim. You must anoint them. You do that with a full heart, you're fully reinstated. But you know, it's interesting. After the Chet Egel, after the Sin of Egel, originally all four sons were spent, meant to die as an atonement. Moshe was mispalel, prayed, 50% of the decree was annulled. So therefore, in Lozani summer, they survived. But initially, they were all supposed to die. If all Aaron's children would have died, what would have happened? There were no Kohanim. So we would have revert back to reverted back to Moshe. Yet yeah, Moshe prayed. You know what this means? Do you know how selfless, how negated he was, Lakovit Shamayim? He did what he was supposed to do. Any mortal human being, to some degree of conflict. My my children, myself, I made a mistake. Now's my opportunity. God forbid I wouldn't do anything negative. But to pray to the degree that our road should be fully atoned or even 50% atoned, that conflict wouldn't have allowed it. Moshe Rabbeinu prayed that all his children survive. Hashem says, no. Your tefillah is only effective 50%. Two will die, two will survive. But we have to appreciate and understand who Moshe Rabbeinu was. It's something which is, which is beyond. One said something. Interesting. Gemara tells us in the Dori, the Jews spent 210 years in Egypt. Why did they spend 210 years in Egypt? Because of the failing of Avraham Avinu. So there's an argument in the Gemara. What exactly was the failing? What did he fail? One opinion is that after God says the land of Canaan will be his and his children, his progeny, he asked the question. How do I know? Okay. But another opinion is that when he went to fight the battle against the four kings, he had, he had students. He interrupted the Torah study. It says, He, he summoned his, those who he mentored in Torah. That's the other reason is given is he was the victor. Now, who were the captives? The captives was the king of Sodom and his people and their spoils. So the king of Sodom, the arrogant man comes out to Abram, speaks like is he, is he, he's dictating terms. The captive dictates terms to the victor. And he says to Abram, Give me the people, you take the, spo the, the material spoils. But give me back my subjects. Abram says to the king of Sodom, I will not take lo michut v'atzroch now. Not a thread, not a bootstrap from you. Nothing. You're not going to say you made me wealthy. So the claim against Avram is, but how did you allow these people to remain with this pagan, this pagan monster? This is, this is a person who personifies evil. You should have said, you, you had the opportunity to bring them tachas kanti ashkina. You could have converted them to monotheism. 
because you did not measure for measure, your children will be slaves in Egypt. We became pagans in Egypt. That's the measure for measure. Okay? We find, as we say, fast forward, Hashem comes to Avram Avinu. I hear the outcries of Sodom. I will destroy Sodom and the communities associated there. Five communities. Avram immediately gets into the battle mode with Hashem and he begins a dialogue. Maybe the 50 time. He immediately discuss either you destroy the community if they in the merit sessions of the 50 tzaddikim, I will spare the community. Maybe 45 goes down, they're not, they're not, they're not no tzaddikim. Therefore, they will have to be destroyed. But what was Abram's, what was his concern? His concern was Chil Hashem. Because what are people going to say? Sure, they were righteous among them. And just as he destroyed the world with, with the great flood, despite this tzaddikim, God doesn't differentiate tzaddik, not tzaddik, he just destroys them all. So here, he's destroying all of them, regardless whether there are, it was known they were evil people there, but how do you destroy? No survivors. So Hashem says, you don't have to worry about Chil Hashem. Factually, there are no tzaddikim. There are no tzaddikim. There are no righteous there. But what was really the impetus? What was the impetus for Avram to speak so strongly? And, and Avram spoke in a way, this is an ochi of vapor. He was concerned maybe he was speaking too strongly. And he could actually forfeit his share in the world to come. He says, I'm dust. If not for your unlimited kindness, I'd be ash, I'd be dust. I, would have, I should have been incinerated in the kiln in Kazdim. I should have been died in the battle against the four kings. These are the four mightiest kings of the world. I survived. Who am I to speak this way? But he did. Now, Klaus are going to Mitzrayim wasn't a simple matter. Avram was plenty worried. It said a dread came upon him. A dread. The, the, his whole, his spirituality and his progeny are going to put in, going to put in jeopardy. They're going to become pagans. How does he avoid it? And why did they become pagans? Because he passed on the opportunity to bring these people back to monotheism. If Sodom now is going to be destroyed, that's the last nail in the coffin. It's over. There's no more discussion. Your children it's been confirmed, irreversible verdict, your children are going to Egypt. To atone for the chet, for the sin of not taking them and converting to monotheism. But let's say I'm able to save them and annul the decree of Sodom and Amor being destroyed. There's a chance I still could influence them. Maybe they'll become monotheistic. So again, that's, that's the idea over here. And that was, Moshe struck the rock Hashem took away the clarity. Why? Why did Ragnar Chassid of Yishmor, there's no greater Chosid than Moshe Rabbeinu. Chosid. Hashem should have given that clarity. But if he would have had the clarity, he wouldn't have made the mistake. He wouldn't have made the mistake, he would have gone to Eretz Yisrael. So who's going to counter the prosecution of poor against the Jewish people? Moshe, I'm withdrawing the clarity, you're going to make the mistake. Based on your choice. Therefore, you will not merit to go away. And therefore, you can be buried in that location. I, and I create a special, special burial location specifically to counter the impurity and the prosecution of poor against the Jewish people. Otherwise, they couldn't survive. Torah uses the term originally. Yedaber Moshe Loom Leimor Hecholtu Biitchem Anoshim Latzovo. You should recruit from you men for the army, for the armed forces. Viu Al Midjon, Loses Nikmas Hashem the Midjon, that God's vengeance should be a in Minyon. So he uses the term view al Minyon. It should say view bin Minyon. 
the army, you go against Midyam. What do you mean? Upon Midyam. You're not upon them. You're going against Midyam. So why does the Torah use the term on rather than against? Rechaim Akhara says something interesting before that. It says, Nikva Sashem the Midjam. What does he have to say? We have to avenge Midjam for what they did to us. Now, we lost 24,000 people. We had tremendous tragedy because of Midjam. So he'd say, We're going to avenge what they did to us. We have a personal claim, we have a serious axe to grind. It has to be Nikva Sashem telling you, no, you have to have in mind you're doing it purely for the sake of God. For the, why? Because you see that the vengeance was delivered and we took, we did what we had to do. For the sake of God, it's a different dimension. If you do it for yourself because you have a personal score to settle, it's not at the same level. So they have Moshe had to instruct him, because to Bring about the tikkun, the correction, it has to be for the sake of God. It cannot be w for personal interest. That you have your own motives why you want to do it. So it's interesting. We find Hoshni Yisro, Hoshni Yisro, after Yisro comes and Moshe greets him, and Moshe tells him all about how the miracles and how we destroyed Egypt, and how Hashem brought about all, everything. So the Torah tells us, Vayichad Yisrael kol ha-tova, Asher osa Hashem Yisrael. He rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done on behalf of Yisrael. Asher itzilu miyad mitzroyim. That he saved them from the hands of Egypt. From the hands of Egypt. That's what he rejoiced. When he heard all that Moshe had shared with him, he rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done on behalf of Yisrael, that he saved them from the hands of the Egyptians the sea splitting and how the sea closed on him and so on and so forth. So the Sifarno says over there, Vayichad Yisrael Kotovo lo somachal avdon Mitzrayim. He didn't rejoice over the Egypt being destroyed. I mean, Egypt were evil. I mean, how do you go and enslave an innocent people and millions of and kill their young, their male, and now pursue them and want to destroy them the proper thing to rejoice over is a person's a true zealot a mechanic and you live for your maker the glory of your maker when you see the evil being destroyed you rejoice of what not the victim who was saved but God's glory has finally come to the fore that's what you rejoice over when does the tzaddik rejoice? When he sees the vengeance taking place. Rather than rejoice over the good that happened to, to the Kval Yisrael, the tears of the victims, you should rejoice over God's glory. That's a person who's a true tzaddik. A true zealot. He's Makani il Kono. And that's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu said. So really, Yisro's rejoicing was at a special level for who he was. But it wasn't the ultimate. And that's what the Torah is pointing out. That he fell short of where, the way he should have expressed it. The way he should have rejoiced. Moshe Rabbeinu was forewarning them. To be able to bring about what we need. That the, the wrong, the impurity, should be fully corrected. It's Nikmas Hashem bin Mijam. You have to do it not because you're taking revenge, because they caused us so much harm, so much tragedy. 24,000 Jews died. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's purely for the sake of God. You do it selflessly. It's not because of your being able to express your anger and your, your, your revenge, but rather it's purely Kovach And when you do it for Kovach the accomplishment is a different level of accomplishment.